Nous avons une croissance du PIB intéressante au Canada, mais ici à Montréal, dans la région métropolitaine, il y a une très bonne croissance économique depuis plusieurs années. Notre taux de chômage est faible. Pour ceux qui ne le savent pas encore, la plupart du temps, ces temps-ci, il est inférieur à celui de Toronto, ce qui est inhabituel dans notre histoire. Les entreprises investissent et la confiance règne. Par contre, si c'est la conjoncture locale, la conjoncture internationale, elle, pose des questions. Nous avons bien sûr le protectionnisme américain qui est à l'horizon, moins avec le Canada, quoique sur l'acier et sur l'aluminium, il y a toujours des enjeux importants. Nous avons le Brexit. Monsieur Philipson, uh, you probably know more about the Brexit than we do, and uh, we'll follow that. Et il y a, évidemment, il y a la relation avec la Chine. Est-ce qu'il y a un ralentissement qui pourrait euh, s'accentuer? Les échanges commerciaux, ils seront pour quelque chose. Dans le reste du pays, évidemment, la question du prix du pétrole, la question de nos exportations de pétrole et éventuellement euh, des revenus. So we are facing locally a strong economy, nationally a strong economy. There are uncertainties ahead. And uh, in that context, we also face a, I would say, unusual situation. Nous avons connu une période de politique monétaire accommodante extrêmement longue. For all the gray hair here, we know that we had interest rates. It was, it was actually unusually low, I would say. But for the younger ones in this room and elsewhere, what seems to be happening now is the risk of increased uh, interest rate which could, for them, mean something of a shock. Maybe for us, it's something we've seen before. So, as we move ahead with all the uncertainties, the monetary policy that we will apply will have an impact on those young people, their perception of the situation, and eventually, perhaps, create some uh, movement, either in the good or bad direction. C'est pour cette raison que votre venue ici devant nous des nuages et certaines incertitudes, bien que pour l'instant ici le ciel soit toujours bleu. Je vous en prie, M. Poloz, acceptez notre invitation de revenir à chaque année. Je vous ai dit à chaque trimestre si vous le vouliez, mais à chaque année, parce que dans le milieu des affaires, il y a énormément d'intérêt à vous entendre. Mesdames et Messieurs, je vous prie d'accueillir le gouverneur de la Banque du Canada, M. Stephen Poloz. Oh, merci, Michel. Uh, C'est très gentil. L'invitation chaque trimestre, mon Dieu. <laughs> C'est un grand plaisir pour moi d'être revenu à Montréal et de voir tant d'amis aujourd'hui. Uh, un grand merci d'être venu. Nos responsabilités comme Banque centrale sont définies dans la loi sur la Banque du Canada. Selon le préambule de la loi, nous avons pour mandat de favoriser la prospérité économique et financière du Canada. Voilà, c'est une noble mission. Mais on oublie souvent de citer les mots qui viennent juste avant ça. Autant que possible par l'action monétaire. Même en 1935, les rédacteurs de la loi savaient que la politique monétaire n'est pas toute puissante. Il y a des limites à ce qu'elle peut faire. Et c'est de trois de ces limites que j'aimerais vous parler aujourd'hui. Avec l'expérience, nous comprenons ces limites de mieux en mieux. Il y a 40 ans, 40 ans on croyait Généralement, que le pouvoir de la politique monétaire était très limité. Mais aujourd'hui, surtout après la crise financière mondiale, les gens sont plutôt convaincus que de son efficacité. Alors, tous les cinq ans, la banque mène des recherches et des consultations publiques pour recommander au gouvernement comment elle devrait remplir son mandat. Notre prochaine recommandation est prévue pour, pour 2021. 
C'est donc un bon moment pour faire le point sur notre compréhension de la puissance et des limites de la politique monétaire. C'est ce que je vais faire aujourd'hui. So for more than 25 years, for more than 25 years, the bank has been focusing its monetary policy directly on keeping inflation low. Now, for someone who remembers well the inflation of the 1970s, this focus makes perfect sense. But, just as Michelle has said, fewer and fewer people remember how difficult those times were. Inflation was not only high, much higher than today, it also jumped around from year to year. And for both households and for businesses, making financial plans was a very risky exercise. Now, the transition from an inflation-prone world was not an easy one. Central banks needed to break inflation psychology by raising interest rates dramatically during 1979 to 81. In 1981, when I arrived at the bank, the average posted rate for a five-year mortgage in Canada peaked at just over 20%. I'll just let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> Can any of you young folks imagine paying 20% for a five-year fixed-rate mortgage? Seriously. In terms of an interest rate that's under 4%. Now, to prevent future outbreaks of inflation, in 1991, the Bank of Canada became one of the first central banks to adopt the policy framework known as inflation targeting. Many other major central banks soon followed. To put things very simply, the bank influences inflation by lowering or raising interest rates to heat up or cool down the economy. The idea is to adjust rates to balance total demand and supply, thereby stabilizing inflation. Now, low interest rates stimulate demand to borrow, to spend, and invest. High interest rates, of course, do the opposite. Now, in practice, inflation targeting is much more complex and difficult than I've just described. Many forces that affect demand and supply in the economy lie beyond our control. What's more, our policy actions take time to have their full impact, up to two years. This means that we're always working with forecasts of where the economy will be in two years, and attempting to influence those things not today, but of course in the future. Now, a crucial feature of this framework is that we just have one policy instrument, and that's our influence over interest rates. Now, this represents the first major limitation on the power of monetary policy. With only one instrument, we can aim at only one objective. If inflation is our objective, we can't use interest rates to target other things, such as the exchange rate or the unemployment rate at the same time. Now, of course, that's not the same as saying that interest rates don't temporarily affect other things, such as economic growth or employment, as we go about targeting inflation. But ultimately, inflation is the sole target of monetary policy. In the late 1980s, when inflation targeting first came under active consideration, and I was a young researcher at the bank, many were skeptical that it could work at all. As it turns out, it's worked very well. Inflation expectations have become firmly anchored on our 2% target. If you don't believe me, just go outside after lunch and just ask anybody in the street what inflation will be next year. And they'll, they'll just say 2%. Well, that's a successful target. Now, a symptom of our success is the fact that many people don't appreciate how problematic high and variable inflation and interest rates can be. In fact, that's a gift to the next generation. My children will never pay anything like the kind of interest rates I've paid in my lifetime, and that is a gift. It's not just that inflation and interest rates have been lower and more stable. With inflation expectations well anchored, monetary policy is more effective. It works faster. The economy adjusts more quickly to shocks than in the past. Firms and households can make longer-range plans. 
Wage negotiations are simpler. Economic cycles are less severe. Unemployment is lower on average and less variable. These observations are based on global experience, global experience from the early 1990s to the mid-2000s. That's a 15-year tranquil period that we call the Great Moderation. To say success, on convaincu beaucoup de gens de ceci, que le maintien de l'inflation à un niveau bas, stable et prévisible est la meilleure contribution possible de la politique monétaire à l'économie. Cela paraît moins ambitieux que le préambule de notre loi, mais les résultats ont été très convaincants. Cela dit, l'idée très répandue que le maintien de l'inflation à un niveau bas et stable permettrait d'éviter les problèmes économiques était mal fondée. La crise financière mondiale a mis en lumière la deuxième limite importante de la politique monétaire. Un bon niveau d'inflation peut quand même mener à l'accumulation de dangereux déséquilibres économiques. En effet, une période prolongée de stabilité économique et financière peut inciter les gens à prendre trop de risques et à s'endetter de plus en plus. Le manque de vigilance des autorités réglementaires a aussi joué un grand rôle. Mais les dé déséquilibres peuvent rendre l'économie plus fragile en amplifiant le fait de choc qui la frappe. Donc, la Banque centrale peut avoir du mal à atteindre sa cible d'inflation pendant un certain temps. Autrement dit, une inflation basse et stable peut être une condition nécessaire, mais pas suffisante pour assurer une croissance économique durable. J'y reviendrai un peu plus tard. Les autorités monétaires et budgétaires des différents pays ont tout fait pendant plus de dix ans pour remettre l'économie sur les rails. En 2014, il semblait que nous étions à moins d'un an de rentrer à bon port, c'est-à-dire une situation où l'économie tourne aux limites de sa capacité, où l'offre et la demande sont en équilibre et l'inflation est à la cible. C'est quand l'économie est à bon port qu'elle peut avoir une croissance soutenue sans mesure de relance. Malheureusement, l'économie a subi un sérieux revers vers la fin de 2014, lorsque les prix du pétrole ont chuté. La banque a baissé son taux directeur deux fois en 2015. Elle a ramené un niveau très expansionniste de 0,5 pour aider l'économie à surmonter ce choc. Le gouvernement a aussi pris des mesures de relance budgétaire. Et durant les deux ou trois années qui ont suivi, l'économie est rentrée graduellement à bon port. Et dans ce contexte, la banque a commencé à réduire la détente monétaire exceptionnelle en place. Elle a augmenté le taux directeur de 1,25 pour, pour le porter à 1,75. Mais comme ce taux reste plus bas que le taux d'inflation, il est clair que la politique monétaire stimule encore l'économie aujourd'hui. Elle stimule l'économie depuis beaucoup plus longtemps que prévu au début de la crise en 2008. Et on a vu ce qui se passe quand on maintient les taux à des niveaux très bas pendant très longtemps. Tout d'abord, la situation a été difficile pour les gens qui comptent sur les intérêts versés sur leur épargne quand les retraités. Par ailleurs, les gens se sont beaucoup endettés, surtout en obtenant des prêts hypothécaires et des lignes de crédit hypothécaires. En 2017, le ratio de la dette aux revenus disponibles des ménages avait atteint un niveau record. Les ménages moyens devaient alors plus de 1,70 
dollars, pour chaque dollar de revenu disponible. Et si on ne tient pas compte des ménages sans prêt hypothécaire, ce ratio devient beaucoup plus élevé, soit près de 3 dollars pour chaque dollar de revenu. De plus, les prix des logements montaient en flèche dans certaines grandes villes canadiennes. Well, this emphasizes the second limitation on the power of monetary policy. When low interest rates persist, debt can reach levels that become risky for the borrowers and for the entire economy. When households carry a lot of debt, they become less able to manage through a temporary period of unemployment. The effect of shocks can be then magnified when they interact with the elevated debt. This can cause the economy to underperform for very long periods. So let me illustrate these points by describing what might have happened had we not started to raise interest rates over the past couple of years as the economy approached home. If we had kept our interest rates at 0.5% from mid-2015 until today, our models tell us that we would have seen stronger economic growth. No surprise there, right? By now, the level of GDP in the economy would be about 2% higher than it is today, which sounds pretty good. But inflation would also be higher. It would be close to the top of our 1% to 3% target range and very likely would be heading even higher. And faced with that prospect, we would need to raise interest rates forcefully to guide inflation back to its target over the next year or two. Forceful increases in interest rates would pose problems for households carrying a lot of debt, of course. Indeed, if we had left rates down at 0.5% all that time, that debt load would be even greater by now, over $60 billion higher, or about $2,000 in additional debt for every single Canadian. And it is certain that house prices would be even higher today, our model suggests by around 5% nationally. So this scenario from our model shows how monetary policy has the power to affect not just growth and inflation in the broader economy, but also financial vulnerabilities. In other words, in pursuing our inflation target, we can create side effects, side effects that make the economy vulnerable to new shocks. And this is exactly what happened during the Great Moderation. And it is what has happened during the recovery from the global financial crisis. Of course, the fact that we have only one policy instrument means we cannot independently try to manage those side effects without putting our inflation target in jeopardy. So the implication is that policymakers need additional instruments to address these side effects. And to this end, Canada has developed a number of what we call macro-prudential policies. Now, these measures include new rules for mortgage borrowing, the so-called B20 guideline, for example, which was implemented by OSFI. The aim of these measures has been to reduce the economy's vulnerability by ensuring that borrowers will be able to manage their debt even when interest rates rise. Now, let me stress that the goal of these measures has always been to improve the quality of new household debt. It was not to slow down housing markets. With that said, we have also seen various provincial and municipal governments put rules in place that are aimed specifically at containing house price growth. Now, to help guide the use of macroprudential tools, we need new ways to measure the economic importance of those financial vulnerabilities as they rise and fall. This would allow us to account for the side effects better in monetary policy. So recently, the bank has started using a framework that estimates the economic growth that is put at risk from financial vulnerabilities. When we forecast economic growth, there's always a whole range of possible outcomes around that projected path that we report to you. Rising financial vulnerabilities make it more likely that an economic shock will cause the economy to follow a much weaker growth path as the shock interacts with those high levels of debt. The gap between our most likely scenario and the possible adverse scenario 
where financial stability risks are realized, this gap is what we call growth at risk. And we can estimate how much economic growth is at risk with our models. Revenant au scénario où le taux directeur serait resté à zéro vers Comme je l'ai déjà dit, la production économique serait plus forte, mais l'inflation serait aujourd'hui proche de 3 et continuerait probablement de grimper. La dette des ménages et les prix des logements seraient eux aussi plus élevés qu'aujourd'hui. L'économie serait donc plus vulnérable, plus vulnérable à un nouveau choc économique. Le risque que ces vulnérabilités affaiblissent la croissance économique et par conséquent l'inflation augmenterait sur toute la durée du scénario. Heureusement, ce scénario. Des politiques macroprudentielles et budgétaires ont aussi été mises en place, et tout cela a permis d'obtenir un meilleur résultat économique. Il est important de comprendre bien le rôle qu'a joué la politique budgétaire expansionniste. D'après nos modèles, si la politique budgétaire après la chute des prix du pétrole, la banque aurait dû fixer les taux d'intérêt jusqu'à 50 points de base plus bas, de 2015 jusqu'à 2018, pour ramener l'économie à bon port. 50 points de base. Au lieu de la mi-2017, il aurait fallu jusqu'à la fin de 2018 pour que l'économie rentre à bon port et que l'inflation soit à la cible. Comme on peut le voir, avec les taux d'intérêt bas déjà et un niveau d'endettement déjà élevé, la politique monétaire est moins efficace que la politique budgétaire pour stimuler l'économie. Par ailleurs, ces taux d'intérêt plus bas auraient mené une dette des ménages et des prix de logement encore plus élevés. Selon notre cadre de la croissance exposée au risque, un nouveau choc économique aurait plus de chances de faire dévier l'économie vers un scénario de faible croissance et d'inflation inférieure à la cible. Ce qu'il faut retenir, c'est que le mix des politiques monétaires, budgétaires et macroprudentielles est important. Dans certains cas, en misant moins sur les taux d'intérêt bas pour ramener l'économie à bon port, on peut la rendre plus résiliente. Même s'il est difficile d'imaginer des scénarios contrefactuels, ces simulations montrent certains des arbitrages auxquels les décideurs sont confrontés. Elles montrent aussi la troisième limite importante de la politique monétaire. C'est la façon dont l'incertitude restreint la marge de manœuvre du décideur. Les modèles économiques complexes sont des outils essentiels pour les économistes, surtout ceux qui travaillent dans les banques centrales. Or, tous ces outils sont fondés sur des moyens historiques et ils reposent sur les plusieurs hypothèses qui ne, qui ne se vérifient pas nécessairement dans la pratique. Chacune des relations dans les modèles de la banque ne vise qu'à reproduire comment une partie de l'économie va se comporter en moyenne au fil du temps. Cette incertitude est plus importante parce que notre politique agit dans l'avenir. Les effets des décisions que nous prenons aujourd'hui ne se feront sentir pleinement que dans deux ans. Au hockey, par exemple, quand on passe la rondelle, il faut viser où le joueur va être et non où il se trouve maintenant. L'impression de mouvement dans l'économie accentue les incertitudes qu'il faut prendre en compte dans nos modèles et dans nos prévisions. The reality is that conducting monetary policy, that requires a lot of judgment. 
Rather than finely tuned mechanical process that many people seem to imagine, policy is much more akin to an exercise in risk management. And as we said at the bank's most recent interest rate announcement, we judge that we will need to move our policy rate up into a neutral range over time to a point where it is not stimulating or constraining economic growth. However, the path back to that neutral range is highly uncertain. We will watch the data as they come in and we'll use our judgment to deal with the uncertainties and to manage the associated risks. One important uncertainty that we're dealing with today is the impact of higher interest rates on highly indebted Canadians. Rising interest rates will mean these people will have to spend more of their income servicing their debt, leaving less for other goods and services. Clearly, these elevated levels of debt mean that raising rates will have more of an impact on the overall economy than in the past. And this is one reason why we've been gradual in our approach to raising interest rates. Now, housing markets are adjusting not only to higher interest rates, but to new mortgage guidelines and rules aimed directly at cooling certain housing markets. Given this unique situation, we're monitoring the impacts very carefully. And housing activity has been a little weaker than we expected of late. Now, mostly, it's housing resales that have been soft, suggesting there may have been more froth in certain housing markets than we previously thought. Housing markets that were not experiencing bidding wars appear to be adjusting more or less in line with our expectations. It will help us better understand the full situation in Canada's housing market. A second area of intense interest right now is the outlook for business investment, which has been less robust than our models indicated for the past couple of years. This mainly seems to be due to uncertainty about the future of NAFTA. Although uncertainty remains around ratification of the new Kuzma, the Canada-United States-Mexico agreement, Kuzma does not roll off the tongue yet. I still like new NAFTA. But we expect investment spending to regain momentum in 2019, especially in light of the government's new accelerated capital depreciation rules. However, we must acknowledge that the future of the global trade environment is highly uncertain right now. An escalation of the U.S.-led trade war would, of course, be a negative for our outlook. But a resolution would be a source of new lift for the global and Canadian economies. Now, given these uncertainties, we've kept interest rates unchanged at 1.75% since last October. And we will remain decidedly data dependent as the domestic and international situations evolve. So it's time for me to conclude. We've learned over time just how powerful monetary policy can be. Canada has more than a quarter century of experience with inflation targeting. And this experience has taught us that using monetary policy to bring about low, stable, and predictable inflation is the best way for the bank to meet its responsibilities. Of course, there's more than one way to keep inflation low and stable. Between now and 2021, when we next renew our inflation control agreement with the government, we will be doing in-depth research and wide-ranging consultations on alternative policy frameworks. En même temps, il ne faut jamais oublier qu'il y a des limites au pouvoir de la politique monétaire. Nous n'avons qu'un seul instrument à notre disposition. L'histoire montre que même une politique monétaire très efficace peut engendrer des effets secondaires néfastes. Et l'incertitude s'invite partout dans la conduite de la politique monétaire. La mise au point des politiques macroprudentielles et leur amélioration future promettent de remédier à certaines de ces limites. Le reste n'est peut-être qu'une question d'effort et d'ingéniosité. D'ici euh, 2021, nous allons continuer de travailler fort pour mieux comprendre la puissance et les limites de la politique monétaire. Nous tirons les leçons importantes sur les interactions entre les différents types de politiques 
Et je sais que certains des meilleurs économistes du monde se penchent sur cette question, tant à l'intérieur qu'à l'extérieur de la banque. Et nous allons avoir beaucoup d'autres choses à dire à ce sujet d'ici le prochain renouvellement. Merci beaucoup de votre attention. Alors, merci. Merci, M. Polos. Merci à pour euh, toutes ces explications, ce qui nous permettent de situer euh, le pouvoir de la politique monétaire. Pour euh, cet échange aujourd'hui, on a demandé à des membres de nous fournir des questions. Donc, je vais avoir deux questions qui viennent des, des membres. Mais la première, uh, la première question est, you know, we have a recent drop in oil prices. We mentioned U.S. protectionism. The uh, new NAFTA is not ratified yet. Uh, U.S.-China trade war upcoming Brexit with some uncertainty. What keeps you awake at night? Oh, all, all of those things. Uh, all of those things. But uh, actually, uh, on average, I sleep like a baby. Okay. Uh, really. Which means I wake up every two hours screaming. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, I've, out, of, out of all those things, I mean, uh, I mean, of course, we've highlighted uh, the effects of the, the recent drop in oil prices, uh, you know, during the fourth quarter was pretty bad out west. And uh, so we did a bunch of arithmetic around that for the January report. And uh, for the moment, we expect it to be kind of a temporary slowdown in the macro economy. Of course, it's or Saskatchewan point of view. Um, but, but from the macro point of view, it's a, it's, a, it's a deviation or a detour on our way back home, as I described. Um, and uh, it's a little unclear to me right now. We'll, we'll just say a lot more about this in our next report in April um, because, of course, prices have rebounded and we've got more capacity by rail, et cetera. So a lot more math has to be done on that. So that's, and you know, things I mentioned about housing, you know, I'm always, always worried about housing just because it's such a complex variable to understand, a uh, very personal decision. And people are responding to the new rules in more than one way. They don't just decide not to buy a house. They decide, well, I'm still going to buy a house, but I can buy a less expensive house. So they look for a, a smaller house or one in a different neighborhood. Um, and the seller of resales has the opportunity to say, well, I, ask a slightly lower price to, to still make that sale. So we're seeing adjustments across all three of those things. And builders of houses, that's going to take time. Because the thing is, smaller houses, it's kind of hard to change the big plan. So those are kind of complexities. It's really the only real thing that really has me keeping awake at night, and that's the US-led trade war. Um, and I, you know, people like to say the trade war with China, but it's not with China. It's it's against a lot of countries, and um, so far, companies seem to be adjusting in two ways. They're adjusting around the tariffs that have been put in place in various ways, because they're not that large, and the most for the most part, some steel ones are pretty large, but you know, lots of exemptions and so on. But um, What that did was, you know, like a year ago, I would have said it was just sort of bargaining. But then it was, over the course of last year, it became real. Mm -hmm. And so people who, who depend on the global trading system to grow their business are nervous about it. And I'm not just talking Canadians, obviously. Mm -hmm. So there's a very strong uh, correlation happening right now globally of a rollover in business sentiment, which, of course, fuels investment decisions. And uh, since it's so correlated across countries, it's got to be one common factor. And I maintain that that common factor is the risk of an outright trade war, which would be very bad for the global economic outlook. Uh, as I said in my remarks, there's every reason to think possibility, which would, if, if the world is slowing down because of business sentiment, then we know it can speed up pretty quickly because of recovery in business sentiment. And so that gives me, you know, a sense of balance, but also some an encouragement that, you know, reality will 
will prevail. But that's, that's certainly our base case is that uh, we make it through this, but the risk is a negative one, that's for sure. We'll pay attention to uh, that too. Um, I have a question here that came from uh, Sébastien Barrette from the Mouvement des Jardins. Mm -hmm. um, I I'll paraphrase him a little bit, but um, you know, people like correlation, we economists do, but journalists do as well. Yeah. Uh, there was an article that said you see the word recession yeah. in articles. It's an extremely uh, precise um, advance warning that a recession is close by. So they were saying that now we see a raise in the number of time recession is mentioned, if only to say we're not getting into a recession. What's your view of the imminency of a potential recession? Well, first of all, it's, it's true that uh, it's a very, you know, it's people underestimate the importance of confidence or sentiment as a driver of economic uh, As a macroeconomist, you think, oh, it's this vague thing, but around your company, it's not a mystery at all. Like if we're, if the board's not comfortable, uh, they're not going to approve that next big investment, okay? Well, that's because of confidence. And, you know, you may not even propose it. As the CEO, you might think, well, I'm going to wait six months to see how things turn out. So we know in the real world this matters a lot and that confidence is not as high as it was two years ago, okay? And for very obvious reasons. So um, that, that is undeniable. So that means then if, if the analysts are picking up on that and reading the indicators and say, well, everything's rolling over, and are uttering the R word in every article. And then, of course, the media think, well, that's the buzzword of, of now, so we're going to write lots of articles about this. Well, pretty soon you start believing that, you know, it's the real deal. And you can talk yourself into one. So you'll notice I haven't said it. <laughs> <laughs> and for sure, it's not part of our forecast. You know, the biggest risk we face is the risk of a, an outright trade war. And I think that would cause a significant slowdown at the global level, which would affect everybody. Uh, so, uh, you know, we just uh, continue to hope that those negotiations are progressive. I'm, I'm heartened by what I'm reading about them. And, um, you know, I can't believe really that uh, the auto business would turn out to be a, uh, a security threat. To the United States, but that, of course, is the other shoe that remains to drop. And uh, my sense is that if, if that happens, then there would be a lot of retaliatory measures, and we would say, "Well, we're in a we're in a trade war then, and we we better find a way to de-escalate that. That can be just like any other war." Yeah, it's a dear, it's a tough prospect. Um, I have a question here again from the public, and I'm going to paraphrase it. I thought, how can I ask you this question? Uh -oh. um, which is, uh, you're a governor of uh, the central bank. You're also a father. If you're and a son, grandfather. A grandfather. But, uh, so if your son or daughter was to come to you and say, uh, Dad, I'm renewing my mortgage, should I go for a fixed <laughs> or variable rate? <laughs> what would you answer to your daughter or your son? Okay. <laughs> so, next question. <laughs> no, I, Seriously, the next question. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. No, 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 no. Like, I, frankly, I mean, I, I, obviously, I don't, I don't give that kind of advice uh, <laughs> because, if actually, you know, I'm old enough to know that every time I faced that same decision, I goofed it up. <laughs> Uh, so uh, it's, it's a hard game to, to, uh, to play for sure. And I think uh, it's a very, uh, if you like, it's a, it's a personal thing. It depends a lot on your own circumstances. And, uh, you know, I, when I was making those decisions, people were making the opposite decisions and saying to me, why, why on earth would you do that? And I said, well, I don't know, here's why. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then, you know, six months later, I'm thinking, ah, probably should have done what that person did. Uh, but then six months after that, I'm not so sure. So it's always like that. And uh, there's so much uncertainty as I try to describe how hard this is. Uh, to collapse it down to that personalized decision like that, I obviously don't do it. But, but I understand how hard that is. So we try to be as clear as we can be. 
Can we be as clear as we can be? And so for like years now, we've been saying, hey, don't get used to 2% interest rates, right? All right, so no one should be surprised that mortgage rates have gone up in the, in the past couple of years, because uh, we were talking about it for a long time. So I'm hopeful that people, if they're listening to that, then they're, they're, they think it through and can manage those risks as I would. Well, it was a tough one. Yeah. Um, a last question, uh, time is running. Uh, okay. It's a question that, uh, it's about whether we can be reassured. We can see that there is tension on the uh, trade issues, uh, but we also know that when we had the last big recession, the collaboration, the coherence of action between central banker was the key to the success we had. Yes. At this moment, given all those tensions, how is it between you central bankers? Okay, well that's a good question. Uh, so that, that relationship among central bankers is, if anything, stronger than I've ever seen it. Uh, the, the, that is the, probably the most highest level of policy coordination that you could describe. It happens in that space. Uh, we meet uh, quite intimately every, uh, approximately every two months, so six times per year in Basel. Uh, we, you know, we meet, we eat together, we, you know, we talk together, we do all that stuff. Uh, and uh, we all meet together again at the sidelines of the G20 meetings and the G7 meetings. So that's a lot of meetings per year. And we're all very comfortable, just first name basis, let's make a phone call, I got a question. So that is truly a collegial group. And so often I can anticipate very well what someone like Mario or Jay will say in a certain situation because I know them well enough from those interactions and you know that you can kind of anticipate then what their issues are and I think that that is as good as coordination gets since we all have individual hmm. mandates so I think you can be assured on that and of course in the you know this case of an emergency that's a well-practiced muscle so uh, you know what happened back in you know 2007 2008 we showed that the G20 had a very strong purpose, and you know that's really why it's built. The rest of the time, it doesn't seem to do a lot, but it makes progress behind the scenes. And all those mechanisms uh, still exist, and those muscles we practice several times per year. So we're, I think, yeah. you can be reassured on that coordination front. So let's hope we don't have to test. Let's hope and... we're just polishing the fire trucks. Uh, Nothing uh, to see here, folks. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're hoping for. Keep the fire trucks ready to go, but never use them. Well, Mr. Polos, thank you very much. As I mentioned, we don't expect every quarter, but every year, you're welcome. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you.